Interlopers. Uh, welcome back. We are in sophomore English now, and our objective agenda today is to give some thought to the short story, The Interlopers, by uh, our uh, short story author, Saki. Let's go ahead and have hymnals open, if you would, please. You should have those hymnals open to 396, and uh, we will spend uh, a little bit of time there. As is often my want, uh, however, before we begin with the text itself, I'm always interested in maybe presenting an idea or two for your consideration. So I'll begin there, then we'll look at the, uh, at the Saki text and try to maybe uh, inject as well some of your observations from the papers that you're handing in today on the topic of, I believe it is, prey versus predator. All right? Let's talk about one of the really important philosophic ideas in the history of speculative thought. And that is this one. What are human beings like in regards to this question of human nature? Now, I don't know if we've mentioned this. Have we talked yet about this in any detail together? Good and bad. Yes. We'll start there. Let's begin by, first of all, drawing a line. It's possible that once I start talking about this, you'll be, oh yeah, we talked about this once already. Um, and this is the nature of these kind of speculative philosophic arguments that I'll present to you, uh, where I will remind you, and sometimes you'll go, oh yeah, now I remember, especially because sometimes I get little iconic types of things on the board, iconic of or relating to sight. Once you actually see it on the web, or you're like, oh yeah, I remember now, and then it kind of, uh, you know, trips your memory. There's kind of two views of the ways we talk about human beings, uh, for your notes, at their core. Fundamentally, that is to say, all humans, not just some humans. The first argument is that humans are inherently bad, evil, uh, fallen, we could continue with theologically laden language, sinful, all of those kinds of uh, views of humans. The great, probably single greatest instantiation of this idea came from the English philosopher Hobbes, H-O-B-B-E-S is his name, uh, in the text Leviathan, where he said, each of us considers every other human being our potential assassin. That is to say, we fear other people because they could be mean to us. Now, for those of you who say, I know lots of people who don't seem very nasty mean, this perspective says, that's only because they're afraid. They're afraid of what would happen to them if they acted out on their impulses. Let's, by the way, point out that maybe one of the most important proponents of this view, right at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, is Sigmund Freud. F-R-E-U-D. We will have much to say of Freud. He is so important in the history of thought for us, especially in the 20th century. And Freud will make this argument. We're basically hardwired to be very aggressive and to go after what we want, and we would go after and kill whoever to get what we want. The only thing that kind of restrains us is the fear of getting punished. That's one view. The other view on the other side sees humans as inherently good, but to some degree corrupted. What does that mean? Well, usually the view is a poor education has led to an individual behaving inappropriately. It's here that we usually think about the philosopher Plato and the Greek philosopher, who will argue to some degree that if you teach humans correctly, they will behave correctly, that is to say, good. The reason for that is that humans are inherently good at their core. They're not evil. Uh, they can become corrupted, but they're not inherently evil. Now this, I'll use a Hegelian term. Hegel is an important German philosopher. This dialectic, this back and forth, this debate, this pushing back and forth happens throughout the history of Western thought. What are humans really like? Are they inherently pretty nasty to each other? Or rather, are they inherently pretty nice to each other? Give someone the chance to be nice, and he or she will be. Sometimes we're nasty, but usually that's because of, and then the d debate goes on. Now, if you'll think about it, we've already kind of broached this subject. Jot down real quickly at 3A one or two texts from our sophomore year that resurrect to some degree this topic. 
I'm thinking, for example, of the Jackson text. What was the name of that one? Right, that possibility of evil seemed to suggest Jackson playing an interesting game. What was her name? Remember, Strangeworth has tendencies towards which side of this line up here? She kind of thinks of humans as always that way, and therefore she wants to try to correct, you say, keep the universe in balance, if you will. Now, let's go ahead in our notes, and we'll come back to all three of these names, one I've already mentioned, and say that when you become a student of the 20th century, as we all will, because of course it's the century in which we were born, yes? We are forced to identify three important names in order that will have tremendous influence on this discussion. The first of the three is Darwin. Darwin will publish his classic Descent of Man, also Origin of Species, both texts highly influential, Let's get a few things out of the way real quickly. No, Darwin did not invent the theory of evolution. Darwin was working with ideas that were as old as 500 BCE. The idea that humans have evolved from other species was not a new idea with Darwin. What Darwin, however, brought that was so important was the notion of natural selection. That is to say, the survival of the species depends upon a certain kind of process over time of mutations. For Darwin, this is critical for us in the discussion of what humans are like, because for Darwin, humans are nothing really more than an advanced species that is fundamentally animal. To that degree, the question here on the whiteboard for Darwin is a question of morals. Where do humans learn moral behavior, proper moral behavior? Are they instinctive drives? Darwin will talk about instincts. Is doing the right thing something you're born with, like the color of your eyes? Hmm. That's a very intriguing question. Darwin will struggle, however, to define what he means when he uses the term conscience. No, a conscience is not that little green cricket that jumps around the wooden boy, Pinocchio. Conscience is rather that voice within the psyche or the mind that tells individuals what is right and what is wrong. Where does that come from? Is that instinctual? Are we born with that capacity, or do we rather learn that capacity? Darwin. Two, our second thinker in this great trinity of controversial, no doubt, thinkers is Karl Marx. Marx will say it is absolutely true that there's tremendous dynamic conflict in the biological world vis-a-vis -vis Darwin. But Marx goes on to say that conflict doesn't stop with the biological world. It also continues with the cultural world. Study your sophomore anthology of the rise and fall of kingdom states, civilizations. And what is the single common denominator between all of them? War. And lots of it. Lots of bloodshed. Lots and lots of struggle between peoples in the same way that species also struggle. Marx constructed a pretty elaborate philosophy that he will coin communism. We often will refer to this philosophy as Marxism, as he will write two really important and famous documents, Das Kapital is one of them, and the Communist Manifesto. If you, by the way, are going to consider yourself a scholar at all, you need to have read before you graduate high school some of these titles that I'm throwing at you. Again, from Darwin, Descent of Man and Origin of Species, the two classic volumes for Darwin. And with Marx, by the way, his name is spelled M-A-R-X. For Marx, again, Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. Both of them are classic, classic treatises on political philosophy. Three, our third, first Darwin, then Marx. Finally, our third is Freud, who I've mentioned. And Freud says it this way. Oh, it's absolutely certain Darwin is right that there is such a thing as biological struggle. No doubt constant biological struggle. And yes, it's absolutely certain Marx is, is, is definitely right that there is some kind of cultural struggle. 
But the struggle that's most remarkable is the struggle of the mind or the psyche. Really? Freud says it this way. If right now we could step into Miss Castalis' mind, which obviously we cannot, but if we could step into her mind, and if we could look at the television set that shows her mind's thoughts, the way that ESPN runs that stuff along the bottom, you know how they do that? So you're watching the ball game and then there's this stuff that's running along the bottom. If we were to run the stuff along the bottom and we were simply to ask the question right now, as Ms. Costales is sitting there, what is she thinking? Freud says two really important things. One, well, we wouldn't read just one strand going across the screen. We would read multiple ones occurring simultaneously. No kidding. No kidding. She's actually having simultaneous thoughts right now in her mind. One of those strands has to do with aggression. She'd like to get a baseball bat and smash somebody with it. That kind of aggression. Another strand has to do with sex. Freud says Miss Costales is thinking about sex all the time. By the way, there's a reason biologically for that. Darwin already said it. It has to do with the survival of the species. How does the species survive? By copulating and making more of its kind. That is a, that's a physical, biological explanation of why this whole thing of sexuality is constantly, constantly apart. That's one strand. There's another one of fear or anxiety, he called it, doing wally hands. Worry, 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 worry. Oh no, oh no, something bad could happen. Something bad, that's, that's happening also all the time. How do people look at me? How do they think about me? <laughs> Remember seventh grade on the first day when you shut up? Oh no, how will I look? How will everyone think about me? Is my hair correct? Am I wearing the right clothes? What if someone makes fun of me? Oh no, how will I see all that? That's happening all the time as well. These are concurrent, and that's just three. There's a whole bunch more than that, Freud said, happening concurrently. That's the first thing he would say about Ms. Castells in her mind. The second is even more intriguing. He says, most of those strands of thought, Ms. Castalis does not know is occurring. So, for example, if we were standing in her mind and we were to go, oh, that's what you're thinking, she would go, I am not. Inception. And we would say, well, you certainly are thinking that. We're looking at it. And she would say, I am certainly not thinking that. He used this term unconscious, which later will often be ascribed as subconscious. Freud himself never used the term subconscious that which lies beneath the conscious. So you can understand where this is headed, right? That is to say, there's all these thoughts going on about which 98% of which we don't even know we really have sometimes manifests itself for Freud in dreams, which is why his classic text in 1900 is called Interpretation of Dreams. If you're going to have read Freud, I recommend that you've read that one and Civilizations and Its Discontents. I've now given you two titles by all three authors. Hurrah, so I'm helping you to build your reading list as we go forward. Now, question. About each one of these thinkers, tremendous influence in the history of thought. Literary writers are aware of all of the ideas of these three gents, and they begin to write texts. Saki is a classic short story writer who is constantly playing with philosophic understandings. So his stories are simply complex. Simply complex. Now, question. As freshmen, did you read a story by this author? Did you read a story by this author called The Open Window? Yeah, we yeah. did. Oh, yeah. Maybe some of us go, Oh, yeah. See, I notice I'm making a 3A observation. This is a story about a poor gentleman who struggles with hysteria. Guess what Freud studied? Hysterics. And this gentleman will go to the country where he can gain some tranquility. He, join, he goes to this house where he's supposed to meet some people. And there he's in the waiting parlor waiting for these individuals to show up. And a young girl who's really good at what? lying. She's a really good liar. She says, oh, my mom's going to come in here in a little bit, and this window is open because, well, there's this whole thing about she really thinks that my, my you know, the father and the brother are out hunting, and huh, it's just crazy. Wait, will you be nice? And when she comes in and starts talking about it, will you just be nice and kind of pretend like you see them there? And he's like, yeah, sure. 
Sure enough, the mother shows up. What have you guys... Oh, nothing, nothing, Mom, nothing. She says, Oh, the window, I'm sorry, is a bit of chill in the air, but I need to leave the window open because uh, blah, blah, blah is coming. Oh, and, and he, yes, yes, I'm sure, yes. All of a sudden, guess who shows up at the open window? Right, the dogs included. To which, of course, the poor hysterical chap just completely loses it and runs out completely distraught. He thinks he has seen ghosts, you see, okay? When they turn to the girl and say, what was that about? She says, you know, it's very strange. He is an interesting guy. He was telling me a story about blah, blah, blah. She just creates it on the moment, okay? Saki's stories are defined in many ways like Maupassant's stories, the great French author, by their endings. Everything for Saki is about his endings. We sometimes call them surprise endings, okay? I like to call them, rather ac academically speaking, ironic endings. That is to say, we think the trajectory of the events in the story are going one way, and then all of a sudden, the events of the story going one way will turn and come back on itself. Now, everything about Saki's short story, Interlopers, is going to help us, or be defined for us, in two things. One, an understanding of the historical context, what's going on, and two, what's the title of this story, and what does it mean? Now, as young students, of course, we looked immediately at the short story title, and we said, Interlopers? This is not a phrase with which I'm familiar. I better Google quickly. Right, Miss Barris? And the word interlopers means? Like out of place. Out of place? Keep going. Um, You're very close. Like intrude. intrude. To intrude. Yeah. To interrupt. That's an interloper. An interruption. Now, at times, of course, it can be out of place. That's right. But the specific meaning of an interloper is what Miss Sin and Mr. Frog did just a few moments ago. They were interlopers. That is to say, Mr. McGee had begun his conversation and they entered the room unexpectedly to somehow alter the course of events. That's an interloper. Now, wait a minute. What is the first thing that we said, this historical context? Please help me to understand and jot down at 3A what Shakespeare play I'm already familiar with that's playing a similar kind of game. Na, 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 na. Well, what Shakespeare play did we study last year? You're right, R and J. R and J foundationally is understood as not a love story, right? For those of us who were young and silly as freshmen, we maybe looked at this as a love story. It's not a love story hardly at all. In fact, if you were to put a stopwatch on the number of minutes Romeo and Juliet are on stage, you'd be stunned. We, we rarely see them together on stage, almost not at all. If you put a stopwatch on the amount of time they spend talking about each other, very little as well. That's not a love story, is it? We understand that is a political story, isn't it? It is a story about two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, right? From ancient... What's the word? We did memorize the play, did we not? No. <sighs> From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny, where civil blood leaves civil hands unclean. That, this is not a play about love. In fact, Shakespeare will wait nine lines before he finally says, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-class lovers take their lives, right, and all of that. This isn't a play about love, it's a play about well, yeah, vengeance, right? What is a blood feud? And how's that, how does that have anything to do with their story? That goes on generations. It is generational. Let's write that down. This is crucial. It is generational, isn't it? In other words, you don't wake up some morning and start a blood feud. Blood feuds have been going on for a long, long time. And what's ironic is that they're so old that most of the time the original source or reason for the, for the grudge no one really understands anymore. It's like nobody really explains it that way. That's just, that's just the way it is. The Hatfields and McCoys hate each other's guts and always have. There's no reason to explain why anymore. It has something to do with somebody getting shot 40 generations ago. It doesn't matter. We hate them. We're going to kill them. They, they hate us. They're going to kill us. What's that got to do with this story? The two guys. 
hate each other because their grandparents right. fought about land. Yeah, we've got to fight over land. Where are we? In the, in the forest. Where are we? Geographically, where are we? If we wanted to jump into our special Europe, ship Europe, that would Europe. take us uh, to Central this place. Europe. You're right. We're in Russia, aren't we? You got it. We're in Russia, aren't we? We are in the woods of Russia. And these two guys are out there doing what? Why are they even there? They're hunting each other. They are. This isn't let's go hunting for food. This is let's go hunting for the other guy I hate. <laughs> Hurrah, they catch each other. And then Tree. our first act of interloper. Right? Yes. Tree, smash. Nature. There they both are, lying pinned under the tree. Let's follow now what happens. It's an interesting exchange. First, notice the exchange is bellicose. There's our ACT word for the day. What does bellicose mean? Coming from the Latin derivative bella, which means violent, nasty. Bellicose here meaning warlike. Their language at first is nasty. Oh, I'd like to kill you. Oh, yeah, I'd like to kill you. But then, notice how does the conversation start to change a bit? Let's be friends. Interestingly, Interestingly, they both recognize the moment of their mortality. Oh, yeah. well, this could be kind of bad for us. Uh, there's this suggestion, maybe even, how do they show maybe a little bit of attachment to each other, growing compassion? You want a drink yeah, it's a you drink of water, you. right? The drink of water motif. Let me give you some water. Um, and then, right about the end of that conversation, they say, you know what? Wow. We have a phrase in Native American language, bury the hatchet. Are we at all familiar with what that means, though? The cessation of all conflict, what we will call in political nomenclature the ceasefire, right? Uh, when you decide, that's enough, let's be friends and get along. And then the story ends? No. no. <laughs> Dang Saki, mean writer that he is. No. Now all of a sudden, they're sure they hear someone coming. Question, of course, is which troops are they associated with, right? Because if one of them is associated, the other one is not, which means all bets are off, maybe. All bets are off. Oh yeah, shoot him, and then rescue me. That's possibility. Or maybe it's a real ceasefire. We're all going to be friends and get along. That's really going to stun the guys who catch us. The last word of the short story is... The second interloper, right? I don't understand wolves. Help me to understand. I once had a sophomore that said, wolves, why are wolves? What's wolves got to do? Oh, wait a minute. Saki's saying a whole lot without saying it. What's he saying? They're gonna die. Yeah, they just got they just got jacked, didn't they? That's right, they just got jacked. In other words, this story will end how? No one will ever know. Right? Yeah. Dark, isn't it? This door laughs, but it's dark, isn't it? No one will ever know that these two somehow reconciled before wolves decided to turn them both into, you know, butterfingers, right, for themselves. And that's the end of the story. It's all over. Questions now must be asked. What kind of story is this? And why would we read it as a sophomore? And what's Saki trying to suggest about human nature? And what do you see as Darwinian? And what do you see as Marxist? And what do you see as Freudian about this story? Hurrah! See how we can play that game? And now notice all of a sudden, this is a game about a whole lot more than two guys who get jacked by a tree and then by some wolves, huh? There's something very interesting going on in this story. Let's begin with our question of human nature. What do you think Saki's saying about humans in this story? You could, you could tell someone you hate them every single day, but when it comes down to it, would you ever actually do anything? Would you ever actually hit them or tackle them or something? Mean mm -hmm. to them, yeah. hurt them. Saki's story says what about that question? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of like when somebody says, oh my god, I hate that person. Well, and you just agree, but you don't really ask why, or you don't go find out for yourself. You just, okay, I hate this person. But Miss Winters, let's point out something intriguing in this story. It's not like they're walking through the woods and all of a sudden they kind of just bump into each other and go, you know, we've been enemies, but now let's be friends. No. What is it that drives them to begin the process of amelioration? What does it mean to ameliorate? 
Do we know that phrase? To ameliorate means to repair, to rebuild. What is it that, go ahead. They have a common enemy. Namely? Nature, tree. Deaths, right? It is, the, it is their own mortality and the potentiality that they could die. Now, wait a minute. Let's think about this for a second. What? <laughs> this Ferris is going to take us there by asking, but wait a minute, isn't that kind of like fear? So in other words, they reconcile, but reconcile because of why? Because they're scared. Scared of what? Dying. Keep going. What are they maybe even more scared of? About the other person living in Ah, oh, that's more what they're afraid of. Okay, we're both pinned under this tree. Who will show up first? If the other side shows up first, I could get jacked. Better have a ceasefire. Is that what's going on here? Yes. In other words, is this a real coming to terms with each other? No. Or is it contrivances based upon, as Ms. Barris has adequately said, fear? Well, Ms. Schroffel, what do you say? Because the minute we say this is all contrivance, we're saying humans are pretty manipulative live. In other words, they don't really like each other. They don't really reconcile. All they do is they're just a scared that the other side's going to show up and they're going to get bummed. So both of them are interested in, we'll use a Darwinian term, self-preservation. Right? Is that what's going on here? Precisely. Or, as Ms. Schroffel says, no, oh, that's not what's going on here. What is wrong with you people? These are really nice guys at their core. They really are sweet. They really are kind. They've just been mean because that's the way they were raised. But in the moment when they find themselves in a common situation, they are able to say, let's be friends and get along. Ms. Reed says, garbage. Wait a minute, Ms. Reed. Are you suggesting humans can't change? Miss <laughs> um, well, Reed says, "Well, I don't know." They can change. So you're saying it's possible this exchange is real under the pinned tree. It's possible. I think under different circumstances, or maybe like the sermon trout is not speaking. Is it real or is it not real? This. This coming together under the tree. I think it's real for Ulrich, but not for George. Um, yeah. Interesting. Miss Dorn's going to make distinctions yeah. between our two characters. Why is it different for one and not the other for you? Because he's kind of feeling like Ulrich. I don't know how to say his name, but he's kind of feeling like. I don't know. Well, what he's like. He sees that he's in like worse condition. He's the person that offers like peace. The one closer to death offers peace no, first. No, no, he's the, no, he's the one who see, he sees him, that he's the one. The one not. who's soon going to die, the other says, yes, now I'll be nice. Because he's going to die anyway. No, I think it's real because, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, he, I think, at least for Ulrich, because he's the one who offered yeah. the wine in the first place, well, and offered. then the other guy. Go ahead, Castalis, but he offered it what? <laughs> he offered it because... He knew that his men would potentially come first. And well, if the men came and shot him. Neither one of them knew. Yeah, they were like, just in the, in the book. The it unknown, said, the it unknown is crucial know. here. Good, good. The unknown is crucial. Is the unknown and therefore the fear what drives these two gents to reconcile? Or is it rather a fundamental human need to reconcile? In other words, fundamentally, are we a species of peace? Or are we a species of conflict and war at our core? Now notice, see, I've asked the same question on the whiteboard behind me, right? Notice the line down the center is starting to kind of, we're juxtaposing two potentialities to which now I ask this question. If you say humans are by their very nature creatures and species of conflict and war, what have you just said about Worland High School? <laughs> Something uh, incredibly just, accurate. <laughs> Saying it. <laughs> Facts thrown out there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Of course, let's point out something rather interesting. 
We kind of have an innate tendency to look at students at Orland High School and talk about them as being on the left side of the line. And then there's us who are on the right side of the line. Miss Hodges just smiles. That's an innate tendency. Of course, think about it. Them on the outside have a tendency to reverse the process. Elitism is bad. <laughs> Which is to say, are we naturally elitists? Yes. We're born this way? Self-preservation. Are we born to exclude and to attack? Yes. Or is that a learned phenomenon? And when you go, for example, to the east side and watch a bunch of kindergartners playing together, they don't seem to care very much about skin color or about socioeconomics or about theology and religious practices. But they don't seem to care about. They do. It's learned. I think it's learned. What does that have to do with like a secret board thing where like it's a thought that you can't, that you don't know you're thinking about, and then something happens and you're like, oh, I I was thinking about that. Like you can't say that more. Mm. Like the bad things when you aren't though. Yeah. So now to the papers that we wrote. How does the notion, and some of you will say, really, would have been nice if I could have had this lecture before I wrote my paper on predator prey. I could have talked a lot about Marx and Darwin and Freud. Why I didn't say it before you wrote the paper, you see. But now we can. What would, what would Darwin, Marx, and Freud have to say about the Saki story in regards to predator and prey? What is a predator? The hunter. The hunter. What is the prey? In the story, who is the predator? There are many the predators. The 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 it was both the guys because they both tried to hunt each other. And then they, they became the hunted. And then nature became the hunters. Who is the prey in the story? It, can, it changes. It well, See how? They're both prey of the other person, and then when they get trapped under the tree, they're the prey of nature. Which begs a really intriguing question. Now we'll ask a Darwinian question. To what degree are the two guys pinned under the tree different from the last word of the story? Wolves. Because they're helpless. They can't... Fundamentally, how are they different from wolves? The people or the nature? How are the two individuals pinned <laughs> under the tree different from wolves. Okay. I'm asking a species related question. Darwin would say humans are animals too. What is the difference between a man and a wolf? We have thumbs. Oh yes, we could talk about some physiological, <laughs> biological differences, but remember Darwin kind of takes care of that with a few billion years of history. Yeah. Right? Remember? What's the difference between a human being and a wolf? Believe what does that mean we can choose? Does it mean? Yeah. We sometimes in theology will use the term agency to talk of this notion of free will, the debate we call determinism in philosophy, the idea of whether there's choice in the universe or not. Is everything predetermined or is there the capacity to, as Ms. Reed pointed out, change? What is the difference between these two men and wolves? They can sit there and think about it. They who? The origin. Wolves don't have the capacity for reflective thought? Because wolves are terrific hunters. No, they kill for Reflecting on their Ah, go ahead, Miss Doran, go ahead. They kill for food. Wolves kill for their survival. For their survival. Mm, they and humans so just kill sometimes just because of like hatred. Over a piece of ground. Yeah. Which is remember why they're in the woods in the well, first place. Wolves, yeah. wolves, 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 wolves are very yeah. territorial. Yeah. Yeah. Wolves are very territorial. Yeah. Hurrah! So tell me a difference between wolves and men. Yeah. Or is the problem in the story we've got two guys? If we would construct a story with two girls, that's different because girls. They resolve conflicts so much nicer. <laughs> Girls are not mean like boys.